This is episode 19 of Entrepreneurs for Change. If you like this podcast, please subscribe to our mailing list at entrepreneursforchange.com. Are you ready to be the change? If so, you've come to the right place. You are about to join a movement of entrepreneurs who are empowering people, saving the planet, and turning their passion into profits while creating the lifestyle of their dreams. If you don't believe us, check out our website at entrepreneursforchange.com, a place where you can be inspired, mentored, and supported by a tribe of change-making entrepreneurs just like you. Hello, powerful change makers. This is Lorna Lee, your host of Entrepreneurs for a Change, a web show about entrepreneurs who are changing the world and designing lifestyles of their dreams. I've been on a little video odyssey for the past few days up in Gorgeous Pai, a village in the mountains north of Chiang Mai, Thailand, that's known for its bucolic scenery, healing hot springs, and the fastest internet in Thailand. A group of us digital nomads spent three days at Merge Space, a co-working space founded by American transplant Ian Borders, creator of the financial services app MergePay. We were up there for an event called Focus 55, 55 hours of project execution, strategy sessions, and group accountability. I can't express to you how valuable it is to mastermind together with other entrepreneurs, even if you're working on your own projects. After the event, I checked myself into the lovely Reverie Hotel, a luxury boutique hotel with lots of tastefully designed spaces that serve as awesome backdrops to shoot a series of videos designed to help aspiring entrepreneurs realize their life purpose and start world-changing businesses. So this interview with Mike Gilliland comes at perfect timing because Mike is a video expert. Mike is a location-independent entrepreneur and co-founder of Time Lapse Strategies, an audio and video production company. He and Yuvi, his girlfriend and the other co-founder, travel the world running their business from exotic locations out of Wi-Fi cafes while having plenty of time to run off on fun adventures like motorcycle rides through the jungle and rice paddy fields of Bali, Indonesia. Now we all have our zone of genius and the ability to help other people just a few steps behind us on the path to success. One of the most powerful things you can do as a change maker to make a bigger impact and reach more people is to share your wisdom with the world using social media. Mike gives us his winning strategies on how you can share your wisdom on YouTube, establish yourself as a thought leader, reach your target audience, and gain massive exposure. He covers why video rocks and why every entrepreneur should consider doing video. The two kinds of videos you need to create, how many and in what order. The key components of a video sales funnel and where the pieces go. How to identify the best topics for your video series. The most common mistake that video noobs make. And what it's like working with a girlfriend 24-7. Show notes can be found on entrepreneursforchange.com slash 19. Also, I'd like to announce a change in schedule. We've been publishing this podcast twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. In order to make room for other exciting projects, we'll be publishing this podcast on iTunes once a week on Tuesdays, 6 a.m. Eastern Time. Now, before diving into the interview, I want to encourage you to rate, review, and download Entrepreneurs for a Change on iTunes. This really helps us reach more people with inspiring stories of entrepreneurs who are changing the world. Also, if these stories inspire you to start a world-changing business of your own, head over to our website at entrepreneursforachange.com and download the Business Changemakers Toolkit to get a jump start today. Now, on to the show. Okay, Mike, so I'm so glad to be talking to you in Bali from an internet connection that works in Bali. So let's start off by telling the audience about yourself, who you are, what you do, and what brought you to the beautiful island paradise of Bali, Indonesia. (laughs) So my name is Mike Gilliland, and I've been kind of a serial entrepreneur I would only say I've actually succeeded in being an entrepreneur in the last year, but I've been traveling through Southeast Asia with my girlfriend, Yuvi, and we've been running our business together, and my website is timelapsestrategies.com. So what we do is edit videos for thought leaders and authors. Our clients will send their videos to us, and we edit them, publish them, and create show notes, and basically just take away all the technical aspects of video creation. 
So I can understand that having a reliable and fast internet connection is critical to your line of business. Tell us about your odyssey trying to track down good internet in Bali. <laughs> yeah, Bali is a bit difficult, that's for sure. So I think we've been to probably 20 different coffee shops and the best <laughs> we've found, maybe one down. That's about it. So it definitely pays to have friends who are investing in uh, really good internet. Ah, uh, some of the windfall benefits of having entrepreneurial friends in beautiful villas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the many. <laughs> we actually hired someone to do a lot of the content production and post-production for us. So we don't actually need to rely on good connections anymore because our video editor over in Saigon is taking care of that for us. So yeah, I would say, you know, I kind of agree with you on Bali. I love Bali in terms of lifestyle design. I think Ubud would certainly be our, my place in terms of its holistic, you know, subculture and its beautiful, you know, just kind of like the beautiful environment. But, you know, it's the internet being kind of unstable, slow, and really crappy has been the big deal breaker for me in making Ubud one of my location independent destination spots. Did you guys ever go check out the co-working space, Hubud? Yeah, we actually just checked it out today. So I think that's going to be our next move if we can't get stable internet at our new apartment. Yeah, I think their membership fees are a bit on the pricey side and with regards to, you know, the going rate for co-working memberships. I think it's something like three or four hundred a month. It's actually a hundred uh, for the maximum one. I think it's a uh, hundred and seventy. But because it's me and UV traveling together, we've got to pay double that. So it's not quite worth it, but it could be. It depends on how frustrated I get with the internet. <laughs> uh huh. So yeah, 170 a month is actually not too bad. Did you check with them on what their internet speeds are? I heard it was seven down, seven up from my spies on the street in <laughs> Bali in Ubud. But you know, I your think... minions, <laughs> your worldwide distributed minions. I love it. <laughs> Did you guys check for yourselves? Because I know like the internet can change and therefore the information might be different. Yeah, that we didn't actually do a speed test. We probably should have, but there's a lot of people working in there and there was no super frustrated faces. So I'm guessing the internet wasn't too bad. Ah, good. So tell me, what do you love about your lifestyle and how long have you guys been location independent? Our one year anniversary of traveling just passed a couple of days ago. So we've been in Thailand and Vietnam and Malaysia, and we just arrived to Bali recently. So we've been kind of all over the place, but really what's made the big difference is where the entrepreneur hotspots are. And that's the thing I think that was most unexpected about my lifestyle is that I'm surrounded by more entrepreneurs and more sort of like-minded people than I ever imagined I would be and than I ever was back home in Vancouver, Canada. You know, I kind of was thinking the other day that we digital nomads, we're like dolphins. We travel together in pods. <laughs> it's true. I see my traveling friends more often in different cities than I do my old friends back home. I've seen Doug in every place we've traveled to. He just kind of jumps in and out everywhere. And my mastermind group is all over the world, but I see them every few months, so... So can you share with me some of your most memorable moments that you never dreamed were possible years ago when <laughs> I'm assuming years ago you had the nine to five lifestyle that most of us have had and exited at some point, right? Well, five years ago, I was struggling with various service businesses. So I was really just all over the place. I really hated working jobs and I didn't have any really employable skills. I'm not the most employable guy. I'm not very uh, agreeable sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I know I'd say the most be. memorable thing has been meeting all the people, especially from the DC and Dan Andrews and Ian Scohan were the guys that kind of inspired us in our current business model. And that's the business model that's actually taken off for us. So getting to meet them and go to the DC BKK event that was in October and we actually got hired to film this huge event. So that was really cool. But then, you know, on the lifestyle side, I've fed jackfruit to wild monkeys I've gone on a ton of motorcycle trips through jungles and rice fields and villages. We did a meditation retreat for a week during Christmas and New Year, so we didn't speak for a week. Oh, you did a <laughs> Vipassana meditation yeah. retreat? Oh, I love those. Where, where were you? We were in Koh Samui. So it was on the top of the mountain in Koh Samui, right in the middle of the jungle. That sounds incredibly beautiful. 
Yeah, it was amazing. So I'm kind of curious, what is it like to be with your girlfriend 24-7 as traveling digital nomads who worked together on the same business? It's really, really cool. It's not like most people kind of expect. We don't really fight that often. And if we do, it's usually about business or something like we disagree on and we almost always come to an agreement. It's really just as good as it I could have possibly imagined it to be. Uh, we get to like share in each other's successes. We get to brainstorm things over dinner. So it's pretty cool to have that kind of support. As far as how we divide it, I tend to take most of the big picture thinking and UV does a lot of the day-to-day stuff. So we are doing a lot more content push. So now that Zach's taken over a lot of the client work, UV's still doing a good amount of the client work. And now I'm trying to focus on marketing and just getting us out there. So we're doing more content. We're starting a podcast. We're doing a video series. We just finished doing a documentary video. So we are basically just trying to take our own medicine. We're applying every single service that we offer to ourselves. So are you primarily service oriented or do you have some means of generating passive or residual income? You know, it's something I thought about. A lot of my failed businesses were, they were attempts at that passive income model. You could argue that this is passive because I'm not actually doing any of the fulfillment and I am taking steps to take myself completely out of the business. But yeah, everything we do is really productized services. So everything that we do is very systemized and it's got a procedure and it's got a, you know, a start to finish. So how do you attract your clients? What marketing channels tend to generate the most ROI for you? 100% of our business comes from referrals. And that's something that, although it's great where, you know, everyone that we work with is happy and they're referring clients, it's not us taking that sort of online marketing approach. So that's what I'm starting to focus on now. So what does your typical day look like? Let's see. We usually get up late, usually around 10 or 11 a.m. We head to a coffee shop, grab some food, do some brainstorming. UV will take over going on her own and doing any kind of client work that's necessary, managing outsourcers. I tend to, first thing in the morning, look at what Zach has finished as far as client work, and I just make recommendations and stuff for him. And it's a lot of it is just strategy and just trying to organize what we're going to do for our own content and trying to find time to record that content. Do you guys work 40 hour weeks or is your work schedule a lot lighter than that? I don't know. It's all fun to me. Like the whole work process. So we get to go to these cool coffee shops and have really good coffee. And we get to hang out with other people we like, like all of our friends are in this group of traveling business owners. So it doesn't feel like work. It's probably in the 30 to 40 hours a week range. But really, we go home after a long day of work at the coffee shop and we just tend to work more. So (laughs) (laughs) we do spend a good amount of time kind of adventuring. And when it's time to step away from the laptop, it, it really is stepping away. So we'll get on a motorbike and just go pick a direction and travel. Well, I think, you know, one of the things or the qualities or characteristics of having a passion-based business is that because what you do to generate income is your passion, it doesn't feel like work. And that's a wonderful place to be. Yeah. And we don't want to work with anyone who doesn't view it the same way either. So it's ingrained into our company culture. We want everyone to be very, very happy to go to work and we want to be friends with them and we want to be friends with our clients. I always received a lot of advice from sort of the jobbers and the managers of like brick and mortar businesses. Don't get in relationships with people that you work with and don't make friends with your clients. And that's been the best thing I've ever done is make friends with my clients. You know, it's so interesting. I've gotten a lot of that generic business advice as well. You know, don't mix, you know, friendships with business, you know, don't get, you know, have your friendships be involved with money unless you're ready to lose those friends. But I think it's really wonderful to be in a place of strength where you can pick and choose the people you work with and the clients you take on so that you only ever have to work with people that you like. Yeah, exactly. And some of my favorite people that I've met along traveling are Jill and Josh Stanton. Like we become really good friends with them. We don't see them as much as we would like, but they're also clients and they've been our longest standing client. And it's been so cool to have those conversations and watch their business grow. And, you know, we talk about our business very candidly with them and they give us suggestions. So it's really cool to have that kind of relationship. Yeah, cool. So I want to hop into the questions that I have for you about video sales funnels, because I know that is a part of what you guys do. Is that typically the process that you 
go through when you work with one of your typical clients who are thought leaders? Do you help them put together their video sales funnels? Or are you doing that more for yourself? Uh, both. So we realized after we were approaching people who already have their video series established that they tend to be missing a lot of things from that they should have done at the initial launch. So you can see, you know, some thought leaders have videos. If you go back a couple of years, the intro was really bad. The music was really bad. The YouTube channel maybe not isn't set up properly and they're not doing SEO on some of the older videos. So that's something we initially start with is kind of setting up their YouTube channel to set them up to get the most success possible. So as far as the funnel goes, we kind of follow the traffic geyser formula. It's uh, the 10, 10, four formula. Have you heard of that? No, not at all. I've heard of traffic geyser. I've never actually purchased that product. I hear I've heard good things about it. So mm -hmm. uh, can you describe what that model is? So we've altered it a little bit, but it's, they want to start their clients off on, you know, just getting as much content out there as possible and getting a lot of ideas. So they try and batch all of their video production into one day. And so what they do is get you to brainstorm a list of 10 of the most frequently asked questions that your customers ask you. And then you make a video for each one of those questions. And then the next 10 in the formula is the 10 should ask questions. So this is what your customers should be asking you, but they don't know that they should be asking you this. So you as the expert can tell them what they should need to know based on your experience. And it really positions you as an authority and a brand leader. And then the four is what we really alter. This is sort of all about the sales funnel. So we do a YouTube intro video, and this is very much based on the documentary style of production. So we'll do an, an interview with the client and we'll try and get them to tell their story and create an emotionally compelling story. And that goes on their, usually on the front page of their website and on the front page of their YouTube channel. Is that the explainer video? I wouldn't really call it an explainer video. It's more of a documentary style. So there's sort of that like in your face marketing approach of the explainer video. And then this is like, here's who we are. Here's what we're about and why we're in business. And that's really the full focus of that business. Because people buy why you do things, not what you do. And that's taken tr straight out of Simon Sinek's video about the golden circle. You should definitely check that out. Great TED talk about why companies should start with why. Why all of their marketing materials should be why they're in business, why they get up out of bed in the morning. How do you spell Simon Sinek's last name? S-I-N-E-K. Okay, great. I'll include it in the show notes. Cool. So the 10104 model. So the last four videos are then this first documentary style. Yep. And then there's a video that goes on the end of each one of your videos, and that gives them some sort of call to action, something to do at the end of each video. So typically, if you're an internet marketer, you want people to sign up for your mailing list. So that's usually the thing I recommend people do is say, you know, to get access to all 20 videos at once or to get access to my free ebook, go to my website and sign up for our mailing list. So after that, they go to the website and then there's another video now, this one sort of explains a little bit more about what they'll get in the mailing list and maybe even a shorter introduction to who you are, because some people don't really go to the front page of your YouTube channel and check out your intro video. So this is sort of another little brief intro. And then after they sign up, they get a thank you video that just says, hey, thanks for checking out my stuff. Thanks for signing up for my mailing list. And if you want even more information, buy my stuff. Okay, so let me get this straight. So you've got your documentary style video that goes on your home page, and then you record a second little video clip that is you saying, hey, sign up for my mailing list and I'll give you this free awesome thing. Mm -hmm. And then the third video is the video that explains exactly what you'll be getting if you sign up for the mailing list and what might be included in this free gift. Yeah, that's on the squeeze page. Oh, that's on the squeeze page. Okay. And then the fourth video is then, thanks for downloading. Please whitelist my email and... Yeah, exactly. And buy my stuff. And buy my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So is that when you actually offer your paid product on the thank you confirmation video, then that basically explains that you should be whitelisting your email and then here's something that you can buy from me that will totally transform your life. Exactly. A lot of people try and monetize their YouTube series too quickly and uh, they try and start pumping products and affiliate products and that sort of stuff in every single video. 
And that really, really turns people off. They're there to look for information and they're there to just solve a problem. So they don't want to be sold to right away. So it's never really a good idea to oversell in your, you know, those videos that are supposed to get people to like you and trust you and to sign up for your mailing list. So overselling in that point is usually a big mistake. Okay. So you've got your first 10 videos that are the most commonly asked questions and basically so do you release those as a series and then release the second 10 as an additional series? Or do you just kind of like let them publish to your YouTube channel, you know, every day for the next 20 days? I prefer to drip them out and I'll do maybe three a week or maybe five a week, but never more than five a week. And if you're the reason for that is if you're regularly on YouTube and you have your shows that you watch almost like television, all of a sudden, when someone publishes 30 videos at once, your whole feed is just filled with their videos. And the first thing they do, if they're just being introduced to you, is unsubscribe. So I never go over more than one video per day because you just completely take over people's feeds and it's really aggravating. <laughs> so do you think this personalized video clip of you asking people to sign up to your mailing list is much more effective than just ending with like, you know, a PowerPoint slide that says sign up for the free gift here with a URL? It's kind of the same thing. I mean, it's, I like to have a personal video. So not just a voiceover or a graphic, I kind of liked you to be the one to talk to the camera and talk to the, the customer, but either one is fine. Some of my videos, I do it with a graphic. Some of them, I will be the one talking. Okay. This is all very juicy stuff because I'm actually about to launch a video series and this is really fantastic because I haven't launched it yet. So you're actually helping me right now by explaining to me how I ought to be doing things. Mm -hmm, uh, great. <laughs> so rolling things back to how to set up the YouTube channel properly, what recommendations would you have? Well, actually, it's more about the process that you commit to from the very beginning. So as far as setting up the YouTube channel, there's a lot of things you can do for SEO and it's kind of boring stuff. It's And you can definitely Google like what to do to set up a channel and what to do for SEO. The main thing is that you are diligent with your ongoing content. That's what really matters is that for every episode that you release, you're filling out your meta keywords, you're filling out your show notes, you've got links to anything that you mentioned in the show, and also that you're engaging with people who comment on your show. People love that and they're much more likely to subscribe if you're actually communicating with them in the comment section first. Okay, so you would actually include links to anything mentioned in the video in the YouTube description box area. Yes. Itself? Okay, yeah. okay. What about using the, because I see a lot of people who do put out video and their descriptions are really short and they usually have one link and that link might be to their squeeze page or it might be to their home page. Do you have any thoughts on doing it that way or do you really think it's... It's a sure sign of a marketer and someone who doesn't really care about their audience. The description is there to help your audience out. So if you mention something and they're like, oh, that, I really want that, that's really cool, then you better have a link to it in the description because if they see just a squeeze page link, they're gonna think, oh, okay, this he's just trying to sell me crap again, so... Oh, okay. That, yeah. That's really good to know. So what about duplicate content? Because I think a lot of that information I tend to include in my blog post where I would embed the video. Is there any problem to having the exact same content on the blog post as in the YouTube description? Yeah, that one's hard to answer. I'm not really an SEO and I'm not trying to sort of hack traffic per se. I'm really trying to build my clients up as an authority. So I'm trying to get them the most subscribers because when people want, they really like you and they want to subscribe, they're so likely to share your stuff, especially if you're not overselling. So I'm more focused on that and just trying to make the whole process as easy for them as possible rather than worrying about duplicate content and that sort of thing. I do typically publish the show notes in an embedded WordPress post with the video there as well as in my show notes. Mm -hmm. But you know, I could be doing it wrong. <laughs> I'll test things yeah. out and let you know. Yeah, you know, so it's interesting. So I switched over to video simply because I found it was way too time consuming to write blog posts. I would find myself actually spending 
four hours writing a long, you know, detailed, well thought out blog post. And sometimes I'd put on all that energy to create this piece of content that really just expressed the best of what I knew about the topic. And I'd get really marginal results in terms of traffic. So I've switched over to video because I think it's actually a lot easier and quicker to for me to produce video content. Do you have any insights or any reasons why you would suggest that people do video marketing? What are the benefits of it over the other types of you know content that one could possibly produce? There's not much that you can really do with the written word to allow people to get to know you personally and to see your emotion and see you know your reaction when you talk about things and when you talk with your audience. So podcasting and video production, that's why we focus on that is because that's sort of the biggest brand building tool that you have available. The written word, especially with how people are now, there's not enough time in the day to consume a ton of content. I personally listen to podcasts and audiobooks, and I don't read much more than a couple of pages of written content a day. So to try and fit like your blog into my already short reading list is, you know, it's not likely to happen. However, if I find a new video and it's one to three minutes long, I'm way more likely to see that. What's the ideal length? Would you say no more than one to three minutes long or? It depends on your audience and the type of content. So I, I'm subscribed to a lot of YouTube channels. I think it's about 150 and I rarely miss any shows on YouTube. So there are some videos that there'll be 10 minutes and I just can't wait to see those videos. There's others that are just one minute and I can't handle any more than one minute, but I still really like those videos. So it just really depends on the content and the host of the show. If you're comfortable being on camera and your content is rich and people love it, then I would say go for a little longer show, you know, do maybe eight minutes. But if kind of struggling to keep pumping out that content and it's more of a like a frequently asked questions approach, I'd say maybe keep it one to three minutes. So what do you love to watch on YouTube? There's Hank Green's SciShow. I'm a big geek, so I'm subscribed to anything about science, physics, the singularity, future technologies. I do tend to really ignore news. There's only one place I get my news from, and that's uh, Philip DeFranco, and he's got a YouTube channel. He produces one video every single day, every weekday, actually. So that's who I go to for news. And then for science stuff, I go to Hank Green from The Sci Show. And then there's a lot of just other random shows that I pay attention to. Do you think the quality of the video matters? Because I do see a lot of crappy video, even crappy video shot by, you know, well-known internet marketers. So does it matter? You know, if you look at any famous YouTuber and the famous YouTubers are the, tend to be the ones that started on YouTube. They're not people who kind of had another medium and moved over to YouTube. They're people that have come from the bottom up and you might see like 3 billion views on their channel and millions of views every month or per video even. So the quality a lot of the time when you look at when they first started producing content is really terrible. But people kind of like that. They like seeing you go from an amateur to a pro. However, if you're kind of already a well-known thought leader and you're starting off from that point, it really reflects poorly on you. So I would say, depending on where you are at with your brand, have the intention to grow in quality, but don't let the lack of ability to produce good quality video stop you from producing video. Because people on YouTube are very forgiving, they're very accepting. You wouldn't say that judging by the YouTube comment section, but as far as video content and jump cuts go, they're pretty accepting. So do you think that it's really a, an advantage to you know, put yourself out there on video and have your audience connect with you on a personal level? Does that really make a huge difference in how you are perceived as a personal brand? Absolutely. You can make a lot of money by doing speaking tours, but you're always limited to the capacity of that room. Video, the room is infinite. So with video, I think you can build your brand a lot faster. You just need to know how to be comfortable on camera and how to produce good quality content, but it's an excellent tool. I kind of forgot your question, actually. <laughs> uh, the question being, you know, whether or not it's you know, worthwhile to you know, put yourself out there on video and whether the ability to connect right. through you know, video to your audience is really going to make a difference for you as an entrepreneur. Yeah, I think it's one of the few ways that you can actually scale your relationship. So 
I mean, you know Dan from the lifestyle business or from the Tropical MBA? Yeah. yeah. We've hung out before and he's talked to me about how his podcast has sort of created this relationship with people that he didn't even know. So people will come up to him and start talking to him like they're friends and like they've known him for a long time. And if you think about it, they kind of have known him for a long time. <laughs> and he might be like, who are you? Oh, yeah, I did say that. The other one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that is great. Customers love that. People, you know, if you're a thought leader and in, in trying to, you know, build your own personal brand, that's great. You just need to be accepting of uh, that sort of weird factor of people knowing you, but you not knowing them. So let's say you're kind of like a total unknown in your space. I mean, you might actually have a lot of knowledge about your particular, you know, niche or more market, but you're not one of the, you know, well-known thought leaders of your space. And, you know, you want to get out there and share your knowledge and perhaps, you know, pull together the information and expertise you have and put it into, you know, info products and be able to, you know, make that your offering. How would you recommend somebody who has knowledge but doesn't quite have a platform yet, get started using video and on YouTube? Well, again, I'm not much of an SEO hacker and most of the people I work with are sort of at a level where they've already got their audience. But if I were starting out, I'd do a little bit of keyword research first and try and discover what sort of things people are searching for to solve their problems that you might have an answer for. And I just make a video for that. I mean, there's so many things that you could do just by doing a bit of keyword research and you might find that there's not a single video on YouTube that answers that question. So that's a huge opportunity. And especially when people are searching in Google for answers to their questions, Google owns YouTube, so they want to push those videos. So the videos tend to be very close to the top of the search results if they're relevant. What if you are finding you know, videos that are appearing for some of the answers that you'd want to, you know, offer? Like, does that mean the space is too crowded for you to get in? Or should you take a different spin on it altogether? You know, you can always hustle more. And I feel like if you're willing to work hard, you can do it. But there's also the argument that you could niche down a little further and answer maybe a more specific question or just dive deeper into a question more than anyone else has. But if your plan is to create a video that's practically identical to someone else's, I would say skip that. Do something that no one else is doing. And that's, you know, with a bit of creative thought, it's not too hard to think of something that makes you a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. There's always, you know, a personal spin you can take on it that it's like, why reinvent the wheel here? So yeah. let's say you do produce some videos and you put them out there to the world. How do you get traffic to them? Because I know that a lot of folks, you know, think, oh, all you need to do is like put out the content and like they will come. And sometimes the resounding sound of silence might <laughs> <laughs> be a little ego crushing. So any recommendations on how to start getting views once they're published? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, aside from the keyword research and doing, you know, answering the frequently asked questions and should ask questions, those will kind of bring people in. People need to like your content because if they click like if they subscribe, that's going to help push you up in the search rankings, which is going to get you more traffic. So you, you need to work on yourself, I would say, first, and then do your keyword research before you start your series, and then use the 10104 formula to answer those questions that people might be searching for with the frequently asked questions, and then place yourself as an authority on a subject with the should ask questions. What do you mean by work on yourself? Is that a personal development type of reference or is it more well, a branding question? This comes from a lot of years producing. I was producing bands, you know, for about eight years. And this is really about getting good at delivering your message on camera or on audio. So, you know, not sounding scripted, not looking uncomfortable, not fidgeting. It's almost like you can just practice public speaking. A lot of that really does apply, but it's funny to say that because I know a lot of people who are totally comfortable speaking in front of a thousand people, but they go in front of a camera and they get nervous. So it's just a matter of confidence and knowing what you look like when you produce a video. Yeah, I think it definitely does take a lot of practice. I've been doing selfie videos for quite some time already. And watching myself is like, oh, wow, I had no idea I did that. Exactly. <laughs> like yeah. nodding my head way too much. I'm like, I got to stop nodding my head. <laughs> yeah. Like editing my own podcast, which I shouldn't be doing, but I'm currently doing it. It's ridiculous how many times I say the word crazy and like. 
Oh, God. So already I can see my speech patterns just totally changing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are some of the common mistakes people make when they get started with video? They definitely expect that buying a nice camera is going to solve all of their technical woes as far as like getting a nice, decent quality video. You can film on an iPhone 3GS, like the old crappy iPhone, as long as you know your lighting and your framing and you have good audio. You know, a lot of phones out there are pretty decent. Like I've got a Galaxy Note 2. It's one generation behind the newest one. And I film a lot of videos with that and it looks fine. But the reason I'm okay with that is because I know my lighting. I get myself positioned in the light well and I frame it properly or I get someone to help me. UV is usually the one to help me. And then I record external audio. So I'll have a lav microphone hooked up to my H4N external audio recorder and I'll record that. Yeah, I think having a separate audio hookup is definitely key in terms of making sure that the audio quality is good because a lot of these cameras, I have an awesome PowerShot G12 that I use, but the audio is not so good. I mean, it's amazing how much your camera will pick up from your ambient environment. Yeah, it's true. It's pretty terrible sometimes. I mean, especially if you're at the beach. Yeah. Right? You're, I mean, you're at the beach, you're like, oh, wow, what a beautiful background. I came to do video. And it's just like, Ksh, the sound yeah. of the wind and the waves. <laughs> yeah. A good tip for that is to just, when you take your external audio recorder with you to a location, bring headphones and just, you know, monitor through your device. You'll hear a lot more. The human ear is built to tune things out. So you actually, you hear at different frequencies at different levels. It's totally weird the way we hear, but when an audio recorder feeds that audio directly to your earbuds, you hear it the way the audio recorder hears it. So you might hear noise that your ear is actually tuned out. That's a really good tip. So we're coming to the end of our interview. I'd love to leave you with a few questions, the three last questions. So what was the biggest mistake you made in your entrepreneurial journey that you would do differently if you'd have the chance? You sharing us this information will help many entrepreneurs avoid making that same mistake. I tried too much to follow my passion, and that kind of sucks to say that, but I kind of expected that I could only be happy by doing what I like doing, and I expected that I wouldn't be able to be happy about doing something else that wasn't on that list. And as soon as I did something, as I focused more on the client and what people wanted and what kind of skills I could use to help them, made it all about them first, that's when things really started taking off. So stop focusing on yourself, start focusing on other people, solve other people's problems. And the other thing I would say is if you don't have any skills, just, you know, meet some entrepreneurs and figure out what their problems are and commit yourself to maybe even a month, maybe three months to learning how to fix that problem for them and then come up with a solution. That's really great advice. I totally agree with you on following your passion. I don't believe that following your passion is enough. And especially if you don't know if your passion can truly be monetized, that's a big mistake. It's totally true. And it doesn't mean you're not going to love what you do. Like I was in audio for years. I didn't do much with video. And then all of a sudden I switched to video and I was kind of a learning curve, but I love it now. And I love like every aspect of our business. And if I had have predicted that would have happened, why well, I wouldn't have predicted that. I would have thought, no, there's, I can only be involved in music. I won't like anything else. So I was definitely wrong about that. So is this business your life purpose? And if not, what is? Yes and no. It's sort of the icebreaker for my life purpose. So... Yuvi and I are starting this podcast we're launching soon called the Future Thinkers Podcast. And I've always been obsessed with creativity and future technologies. So that's what I'm really excited about. And so we focused our business on being a service to provide to people who are thought leaders in that space. So I'm targeting people who I both want to meet out of my own interest, but who would be, you know, perfect for what Time Lapse Strategies offers too. That's a really good strategy. I love it. So how can we best stay in touch with you? Email is good. I'm terrible on Twitter, but uh, eventually I check Twitter maybe once a week. So, you know, you can hit me up at Twitter at Mike Gilliland. And my email is Mike at TimelapseStrategies.com. Thank you so much for sharing with us your expertise. And we'll go ahead and make sure we link to your websites and your social media on our show notes. 
Yeah, no problem. If you want to cut out the rambling too, you can send the audio to me for editing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I might take you up on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, folks, for listening to the Entrepreneurs for Change podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us reach more people with inspiring stories like this one by giving us a five-star rating in iTunes. If this podcast inspires you to join the movement of change-making entrepreneurs, we'd love to give you a jump start with our free Business Changemakers Toolkit, which you can download at www.entrepreneursforachange.com slash join. If you have a change maker in mind you'd love for us to interview, go to entrepreneursforachange.com slash suggest and tell us who and why. Finally, feel free to stop by facebook.com slash entrepreneursforachange to share your thoughts and say hello.